Welcome to the Robbie Rose Show. My name is Robbie Rowland. I will be your host this evening. Now let's hear from tonight's guest. If our joints cannot express movements with a high amount of capacity, it doesn't matter what your muscles can do. It doesn't matter how strong your muscles are. You will develop under compensations and dysfunctions. This is the human body. All of our joints are, are pivot points, and they can create separate movements as opposed to the musculature. What's going on, guys? It's Robbie Rowland, your host of The Robbie Rowe Show. Uh, personally, want to thank you guys for tuning into today's episode. I'm super stoked to bring you um, kind of something out of, I guess... I guess I should say out of the norm, right? I feel like when people think of my podcast, they think of it as being a baseball podcast. Well, um, today's episode is is more going to be towards uh, optimization, right? Uh, I have Amir. I'm not even going to try to pronounce his last name because I just will look stupid. But uh, Amir and I first got introduced via Instagram. Actually, we've never met in person, just through Instagram. He he probably has, we talk about it on the show, we talk about how he has literally the best Instagram name in all of Instagram history. If you don't know Amir or are not familiar with Amir, uh, go to your Instagram app, type in beard the best you can be. And all one word, and, uh, and then you'll see his account. And you'll see that he does crazy cool awesome stuff, moves like a freaking specimen, looks like a specimen, has got a beard like a specimen. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm man crushing, totally fine. Anyways, um, so yeah, today's going to be, you know, a, just a cool episode. We'll, we'll dive into his backstory, uh, dive into a little bit of uh, diving down like the wrong path in life and kind of find where Amir uh, went wrong, what he learned from doing what he did, diving into FRC, um, and he's got some great nuggets for you guys. So I'm excited to bring him to the Robbie Rose show. Uh, definitely think this will be beneficial for, for you guys. Um, and you know, even if you are like a baseball player coming to this episode, expecting something baseball related, definitely take something out of this as well. I mean, Amir is a movement specialist. And when I talk on my show a lot about, you know, how bad do you want to be successful? Then if you want to be very successful in your baseball career, then there's certain things that you have to implement into your routine to feel optimal, move optimal. And, um, and this is kind of right up that alley, right? You guys know that I think from following me on Instagram that I'm very, very passionate and, uh, pretty much addicted now to the whole FRC space. And that's kind of why I wanted to bring Amir onto the show was uh, to get his take, and you heard in the soundbite that he's very passionate as well. And um, so, yeah, I think it's going to be a great episode for really everyone involved. Um, like I said, you can follow Amir on Instagram, Beard the Best You Can Be. And uh, yeah, so we dive uh, we dive down some rabbit holes today, but totally flowing podcast. Uh, I will say, guys, this is this is the first episode in which I'll have to hit the explicit box on the uh, the platform that I hosted on. But um, with that being said, like it's a super real, super authentic episode. Amir takes us down, you know, some of his dark days and how he got there and how he got out of them and what he learned from it. So uh, to me, uh, being a human being, knowing that I'm not perfect, knowing that uh, we do go down some dark paths in our lives, like I freaking love it. So guys, today we talk a lot about, you know, human optimization. And uh, I know if you guys are longtime listeners to the show, uh, you know that I totally geek out about all things, you know, optimization, optimal movement, obviously being Amir being a movement specialist, we definitely dive into optimal movements. But um, with that being said, like there's a lot of things that we could utilize in, in today's day and age to kind of hold us accountable to be optimal, right? And uh, that's kind of where I'm uh, I'm at that point right now in the show where I'll give a live read and I'll talk about a sponsor of the show in Aura Ring. I know you guys who are familiar with my Instagram see a lot that I post on my stories and it's, uh, you know, I get tons of questions as far as what app is this, what app? So anyways, anything I post on my Instagram about my sleep quality, it's, uh, it's Aura Ring. So it's a ring that you literally wear on your finger. I wear it on my index and my middle. And um, I basically just wear it to, to bed. I'll put it on right before bed. 
and uh, it'll give me a full page outline of how I slept. I'll pull it up right now on my phone, but it's a super detailed approach on how I slept. It's, it's, it gives you a readiness score for how to attack your next day. And uh, pulling up my sleep page right now, it'll give me a total sleep, gives me hours, minutes, efficiency, restfulness, REM sleep, deep sleep, latency, timing of your sleep, gives you your resting heart rate, gives you your heart rate variability, it gives you your body temperature, respiratory rate. It's giving you all this data and it's uh, it's compiling all this data and then giving you a score. So for me, you know, um, waking up in the morning, checking my score, seeing my readiness, today it was at a 96. I think that might be an all-time high for me. But even if it's at, you know, uh, if, if, say it's at like a 48 and I didn't sleep good, then I probably shouldn't go into the weight room and do a bunch of PRs, right? It would be smart for me to take another day, get better sleep, and then go. But uh, anyways, that's what I love about Aura Ring. Uh, you basically just wear it on your finger and let the rest do the do the work. But um, what I can do, being a podcast listener, is uh, I can save you fifty per, fifty dollars. Not, I was going to say fifty percent. That, that'd be crazy. But I can save you fifty bucks on your on your Aura Ring if you're interesting. Uh, if you're interested, sorry. Uh, to optimize your sleep, your your daily life. So go to go to the show notes of this episode. You'll scroll down to see where it says sponsors, and you'll see Aura Ring, um, and it'll give you a link, and you just click that link. It'll take you right to the website. But basically, it's just AuraRing.com, and um, discount code would be Robbie Row One Two. Again, AuraRing.com. Discount code Robbie Row one two R O B B Y R O W one two and I'll save you fifty dollars off your purchase of an aura ring. I couldn't recommend this anymore to people who are in the business of optimizing their life because as we know, especially in the athlete space, you know, sleep is so important. Quality sleep. Um, so yeah guys, well without further ado, here's Amir. <coughs> All right. Welcome ladies and gentlemen to the Robbie Rowe show. Uh, my guest this evening, I have no idea how to pronounce his last name, and I'm not even <laughs> going to try, um, but his first name is Amir. Um, can I just call you Beard the best you can be, like all show, or is that offensive? <laughs> no, I mean, honestly, I kind of prefer it. It's weird. <laughs> Dude, you know how some people are, though, with like their IG tags? You know, they're like, that's not me. That's just my Instagram. And I, I mean, that's you. I, I hate it when people say that. I'm like, that's you. It's all good. It's no shame. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, so uh, Amir, uh, welcome to the show, man. I appreciate you coming on. How you doing today? I'm doing good, man. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Nah, dude, uh, I can't wait to freaking geek out on some optimal movement <laughs> conversation, dude. <laughs> uh, shoot, man. Uh, so for, while we're on the subject of Instagram and and dope names, where like, I, take me through the story. How did it come into fruition that Beard the Best You Can Be was going to be your, your Instagram name? Because that's <laughs> <laughs> So honestly, I, I wasn't big on Instagram for a while. And this past year, I, I, I met up with a couple of homies and they were kind of, kind of like ragging on me. And they're like, why don't you step up your Instagram game and start posting on there some more? And I just don't, I didn't really, really care about social media all too much. But I was like, all right, I'm, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this right. I'm like, the first thing I got to do is get a get a legit name. Right. So I'm texting my sister. I'm like, you got to help me figure out a name for this stupid social media thing. Like, I don't know what the hell to call it. I'm like, it's got to have beard in it and maybe something with like mobility with it. So we kept just texting back and forth, beard the best this, beard the best that. And then we're like, and then my sister texts me as a joke. She's like, just put beard the best you can be and just call it a day. I was like, wait a second, beard the best you can be. I'm like, that's it. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's amazing. Dude, I, I'm I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm happy that you gave like credit to where it's due, right? Because some people get into that particular situation and they're like, "Oh, it was all me. It was it was all me. Take all the credit." No, not at all. So that's that's, that's my sister right there. Yeah, that's big time, <laughs> you, dude. Um, so I, I mean, obviously, we're starting the show like super weird, but that's that's totally cool. Um, where like are have you always been a big beard guy? I mean, you said that you wanted that in in the name, so I'm assuming that that's kind of been your thing for a while. For the past like three to four years, it really took off like three years ago. I just had I had like a day, and I was like, you know what? This is going to be the day where I just let it go and I stop trimming because I, I used to I always used to have facial hair, right? But I never let it go. 
I would let it grow for like a month. It would get awkward as fuck, and I'd chop it off. <laughs> and then uh, I just had, I, I just, I just had one day where I was like, you know what? Today's the day you don't chop it off, and I just let it go. Yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't grind past that like itchy phase. Oh, that's the worst. <laughs> yeah, it just it looks like pubes on your face. It doesn't yeah. look appealing. It feels like shit. Um, but well, it yeah, depends just, on who you I ask, right? A commitment. <laughs> uh, for, true, true, for, true. For me, like, I mean, I think all those grind periods are just worth it because then you get to wake up in the morning, roll to the bathroom mirror, and go, "Yeah, that's that's what I'm rocking." <laughs> I'm be- I'm I'm beautiful. <laughs> oh man i gotta put that in the, the freaking quotes all right um so dude um for the audience obviously everyone now that's tuning in is probably going like what the heck are these two talking about but we do want to dive into some some dope stuff right and um so you go to your instagram page for those of you who listen and check them out on your instagram app beard the best you can be um, first things first, man, we see obviously movement specialist, strength coach, FRC, kin stretch, all this good stuff. I want to dive into like, what is your background and how did you kind of come to be as far as all of those different areas? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so growing up, I, w- I was put into martial arts when I was five years old. So that was pretty much my sport. It was martial arts. And then I took up soccer a couple years later. So I started when I was five years old. Did Taekwondo for about 11 years, got my black belt. I was about 14, 15 years old, um, and I stopped doing that. I just gave up Taekwondo, gave up soccer, and I actually kind of nerded out on paintball. <laughs> <laughs> what year was this? Was this when it was, like, huge? Yeah, yeah, paintball. This was, what am I, 31 now? That was probably 16, 17 years ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. oh, yeah. This this was like the prime of paintball. This shit took off. Everyone's doing airball and all this stuff. I got like three different guns. I, I feel like hot shit. Um, of course. So I, so I totally nerded out on paintball for like three to four years. And now I'm probably 19 years old. I hit like a big party phase, started going hard, drinking and doing drugs and kind of going down the wrong path. Mm-hmm. Um, and I And I actually, I got busted for a DUI when I was 19 years old. Uh-huh. And I lived around... 20 minutes away from everyone else, all my friends. And I, and I was the dude that had like the car and would pick everyone up. Mm. So I get the Dewey. All my friends were like, well, you were the guy that drove us around. We're not going to come pick you up. Um, so I had like no homies to kick it with anymore. So I'm stuck in my house. I got a DUI. I feel like shit. Um, and I was always kind of like the small kid growing up. I didn't really have a lot of muscle and I couldn't put on size at all. So I thought to myself, I'm like, you know what? You've got a year off driving. You're not going to be going out much. Order a dumbbell system, like Bowflex. That's actually what I ordered, the, the Bowflex dumbbell <laughs> system, an adjustable bench. And I literally just worked out every single day, ate a shit ton of food, put on like 30 to 40 pounds of muscle, and just like came back the next year as just like a beast. And you were 19? <laughs> so I, 19, 20? Yeah, I was 19 going into 20 years old. And I just I put on a shit ton of muscle. And I just start, I started doing like bodybuilder type stuff, aesthetics training. Yeah, we're, so, we're going to have to contact Bowflex and see if they'll sponsor this episode. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> so so that's how I got into like working out and training, but it was purely aesthetics fix. All I cared about was like getting pumped up, getting those bro biceps and the big chest and all that crap. And now I'm now let's take like another three to four years. I'm kind of kind of getting back into like the party scene once I got my license back and I was kind of going down the wrong path once again. Um, and then my dad came in my room one day cause I was living at home at like 23 uh-huh. or 22 actually. Um, and he's like, what the fuck are you doing with your life? And I'm like, I genuinely do not know. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. So he, he's like, he's sorry, he's this Persian father. He's like, I'm June. You need to do something with your life. I will help you. So, so this guy, he's like, well, you're really into working out and training all the time. I'm going to try to find something that you can do for this. He finds a school down in Orange County. It's a personal training school. They got like a 16-month program or something like that. And we go down, we check it out, and I'm like, yeah, this is what I want to do. I want to be a personal trainer. Uh-huh. Um, so I kind of just jumped into that. But honestly, I just I, – I, at the time, I was just looking to do something. I didn't know what I was going to do for my life. I just wanted a job and kind of feel better about myself. So I got into personal training for probably the wrong reasons. Yeah. Um, um, so I kind of went down that path. And once again, I just did purely aesthetics training. My body was beat to shit. I had a ton of injuries. 
a ton of limitations, no flexibility, no movement quality, no mobility, no nothing. Mm. Um, and, and, and now I'm 28 years old. I've been a trainer for three years. My body's broken and I'm, and I'm preaching health and, and, and strength to people. And I, it kind of just feels wrong. I'm like, how come I don't have my health and strength? How come I'm so beat up? Mm. Um, I just kind of I drew it up to, to get an old, kind of like everyone else does. But you probably appear old. like you probably appear super fit at that time, though, right? So like outside it's, looking in, you're like, this dude gets it. Yep, exactly. Totally. I was like, everyone would look at me like this guy's jacked, like this guy's the strong guy. Like I want to work out with him. Right. Um, so I get like I get business, but I like deep down inside, I'm like, fuck, I don't know if I can genuinely help people. I wasn't very confident. Yeah. Um, so at 28 years old, I'm kind of in a really shitty spot in my life. Got some depression, anxiety. Don't know where I'm going. I don't know if I have much of a future in what I'm doing. Totally. Yeah. Um, and I, I see all these inspirational athletes on, on Instagram and social media and stuff like that. The Hunter Fitness or Hunter Cook, um, Ido Portal, all these guys who mm. do amazing things with their body. Um, so I'm out for a walk one day. I sit down on a bench and I have this vision of me turning into that, me becoming something like that where I can do whatever the hell I want with my body to be able to share a message and educate and inspire and motivate and help people. And I had this like random image uh, that one day and I kind of like just, I went right to it and I was like, you know what? I want this. I want to chase after this. So um, that was three years ago. Like ever since that day, I've just been, I've been going after it like a maniac. I got obsessed with this type of stuff. So I got into movement and mobility and being able to kind of, have more freedom within my own body, similar to Hunter Cook and similar to Edo Portal and these type of athletes. And I just went down that rabbit hole and I tried to educate myself as much as I could and then implement the work within myself. Um, and then it was just a gradual progression and evolution. Um, and then about 15, 16 months ago, I stumbled upon FRC because of Hunter. Mm -hmm. um, I, always, I always thought he was the master instructor. He was, he was teaching these seminars and I was like, you know what? I want to go to that. I want to go check, check out what, what this is all about. So I went there September 2017, and I remember like the first day I was there, the light bulb moment in, in oh, my life. Yeah. I was like, holy shit, all this makes so much sense. And I was kind of going to that path, but I couldn't really articulate it without their scientific literature yet because right. I didn't have that information. Um, so ever since FRC, like I just – I went down the rabbit hole, and I implemented all the work, and I got creative with some different kind of concepts and really implemented everything. Um, and then this is kind of like what you see now on, on my social media is like two to three years ago, my body was completely broken, no mobility, no flexibility. I go through this kind of wild little journey. I learn some things, implement the work within myself. And now, um, now I'm able to kind of do what I'd like to do with my body, which have a little bit more freedom and be able to express movements. So it was kind of like this wild little journey that kind of indirectly put me on this path. Yeah, you know what's crazy, and, and I and I love like where this is going, just because I think there's a lot of people out there, dude, that like see these types of accounts on Instagram, like yours or whoever is on Instagram with their shirt off and just jacked and moving like a freaking animal, and they go, "I can't have that. I can't achieve mm -hmm. that. I'm just I'm just another nine to five desk guy, right?" But mm -hmm. I think it, there's so much power in that, as far as what you said about having that vision of just like, okay, I want this. Now, what is stopping me from really attaining that goal, right? It's just, it's having that vision and, and just going after it. Like in that process where you were at in your life, what were like those things that you said, okay, the, this is what I have to do. I got to take care of this step, this step. Like what was kind of, was it even a step-by-step -step process or was it just like, let's go? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it, it was kind of like, let's go, um, and for, for me, it was, it, was my, it was my mindset. It was my perspective completely changed that day. Beforehand, everything was, everything was gray. Everything was doom. And, and, and like nothing, everything was so dark in my life before that. You know, like I wasn't a positive person. I wasn't a confident person. Um, so I was really down on myself. But I remember when that day happened, like everything changed. And the way I, I view things completely changed. So everything that came to me after that, it was an opportunity as opposed to an obstacle. It was an opportunity to grow, to evolve. So I just took all that positivity and then I just started like – I started just like going down this rabbit hole of watching all these practitioners and, and all these athletes that I uh, aspired to be one day and just implemented what they were doing within myself. And I like there were some days in the, in the first like six months, I spent seven to eight hours every single day training myself. Mm. Mm. And I just put all that energy and my focus on just – what I wanted to achieve. And I, and I kept that positivity 
and by no means was it all um, all easy in that process. I mean, totally, there's even yeah. more. There's even more periods in my life after that where things got really fucked up. I got injured really bad. I was out for like 13 months. So there was an opportunity for me to completely just give up and be like, you know what? Fuck this. It's not for me because I got I injured myself really bad. Um, but I just continued with that positive mindset and kept educating myself. If I couldn't train, I was watching videos. I was learning. I was educating myself. So I just continued to just kept that as my focus and as my number one goal. Yeah, I think that and that's prevalent too with a lot of guys, man, is, you know, I know you talked a little bit earlier about like anxiety and depression. And I think we live in a culture where we're trying to, we don't really, you know, that's not, that's not like the front and center thing. Like no one really just like talks about it because you're, oh, I'm, I'm weak if I, if I talk about it or if I experience it or freaking whatever, dude. But in reality, like if you're an athlete, um, you're going to have terrible roller coaster rides dude that are constantly up and down and you're and whatever it is like you know you're lying if you're an athlete and you say you don't go through that crap you know just because you you do and i think for what you said about just remaining as as positive as you can right like i think uh surrounding yourself with other positive influences around you would be like a big thing but you know, what would you say, like, when you were in your, like, darkest moments in that, it's saying, like, getting injured, not being able to do what you love for an extended period of time, like, what were some of those things that served as your anchor, like, you were able to kind of, like, hold on to and, and say, like, you know, be, I guess, be able to be positive throughout that? Yeah, my, my biggest thing is no matter what, if you're down or up, always move forward, always do something that day, whatever day it is. To help progress you forward, whether it's educating or reading something and, and, and teaching yourself something or if able to train something else, something else that wasn't injured or bothering you or whatever it may be. But no matter what, if you're up or down, continue to move forward. We can still do things that will help us in the future on that day that we might be feeling like complete shit. So mm -hmm. no matter what, don't let the day go to waste and, and just do something that helps you move forward. Mm, that's so true, right? Like, I mean, I remember when, when I, like I told you before the show, like when I blew my freaking lat out, dude, obviously like this, the last thing you want as a, as a pitcher in, a, in baseball. But at the same time, I took my 24 or 48 hours, whatever it is, and, and sulked and felt sorry for myself. But then, you know, once that was over, it was like, you know, I may not be able to do this or that or this. I still had my legs. I could still go on hikes. I could still, you know, like we talked about dive into FRC and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I think the biggest component is, your mind right like i mean yeah. we talk about physical ailments um i think your mind is the, the the thing that you know really can can be boosted through any type of injury you know and uh i am curious like i know kind of off topic but um when you got hurt did you dive into like some some books that i can like write down and link in the show notes um no books in specific actually it was more listening to, to different kind of podcasts mm. and just reading different kind of articles the and robbie stuff like Rocho that. podcast um, i know you dove right yeah. into it got it <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir you're rogan man you guys are both up there yeah yeah, yeah i just topped them actually i just i just moved past them in the charts yeah oh shameless <laughs> I love it. Yeah, but, but but nothing too specific. But the cool thing about my injury, so I I was doing box jumps on exercise mats, like a complete jackass. Oh, dude, that's a never fine. jump on fucking <laughs> exercise mats. So I'm, I'm I'm helping out one of my clients. She's a dive coach in uh, at some high school. So I go there. I do some strength and conditioning for the kids. They fuck around on break time, jumping on exercise mats. I turn around and I yell at them, "Don't fucking do that. That's dangerous." Oh. So about thirty minutes later, they're all out. I'm sitting with my friend. We're trying to decide where we're going to go eat. She's indecisive. I get bored. I start jumping on fucking exercise mats like a jackass. So so I'm jumping up and down. I'm getting pretty high. I'm throwing more mats on there, and I just didn't really think of, think it very clearly. Um, but I jumped up about four and a half, five feet high, jumped on the exercise mats, and it slid out from under me. And I landed directly on my neck and whiplashed my head into the hardwood floor and just concussed the shit out of myself. Oh. Now, the cool thing about this, which I didn't know at the time, it was it was going to take me on, once again, a different path of understanding health in a different way. Before that, I was doing everything for my physical body. You know, I was doing things for my joints and for my muscles and shit like that. But a lot of things that were going on within my body was gut health issues as well. Mm. So – so months later, I have all these inflammatory type symptoms, concussive symptoms still going on, and I have a ton of aches and pains my entire 
entire body feels like it's lit up. Um, chronic injuries and, and just shit that's really reoccurring and a lot of inflammation. Um, and these were stuff that was kind of going on before, but it really got brought to life after this injury. How old were so you at the time really, when, when you did uh, this? Yeah, so uh, this was right after I had like that moment where I was going to make a change. It was literally four months after uh, that after that day. So I was 28. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. so I was 28. So I get fucked up. My body's all destroyed once again. Um, but it led me down a path where I had to discover things about my gut health. And I kind of rekindled a, an old friendship um, with someone I kind of knew years back. And she was really into nutrition and gut health and stuff like that. So she actually – she coached me through some things, and I learned a lot from her. Uh, Stephanie Obregozo, mm-hmm. um, amazing friend, and really helped me understand the gut health element, which is something I feel like a lot of people have not really understood too deeply, and a lot of issues are kind of arising from that as well. Totally, dude. Uh, I, I'm, I'm like sitting here like trying to decide if we should just take the plunge and dive down to like the nutrition and, and optimal health like rabbit hole, or do we stay on – physical topics but honestly dude like you know that's something that i could geek out about and i think that's uh that's something very prevalent i think with uh with the the explosion of i guess like the ketogenic space and all of those people and and i guess the optimal living and obviously with social media like all that stuff kind of blows up anyways but um i think there is starting to become more recognition with like gut health gut microbiome and like all of these like little little hacks to implement you know a better routine for you to just basically feel better right every morning that you wake up and you roll out of bed i am curious man i'm a big routine guy um are there any like specific routines that you implement for like your gut health i mean just besides just like regular i take care of your diet avoid taco bell <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I stay pretty good on my diet, and then I just do stuff like intermittent fasting or fasting. Um, I, 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 I think the world of fasting. I, I, I do a one-day fast, like once a week. I do a, a bigger fast, maybe two to four days every four weeks. Um, and then I'll do like a really big one. Like my last one was five days, and that was a few months ago. So I, I'll probably do that maybe every three to five months. Dude, we're the same person, man. Did you know that? <laughs> so I'm, I'm like, I geek. I think fasting, like, is 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 as close to the end all be all, like, as we can get. And yeah. um, I don't even know why I do it. Sometimes, <laughs> honestly, like, sometimes I just do it to be like, you know, those sick mental games that you can play with yourself. Like, yeah. you, you you won't not eat for a week. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Try it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, dude, like, I mean, I'm, I don't think I've eaten in 36 hours. I don't even know. You know how it is, though, when fasting, like you do it the first couple times, you're like, I'm never going to be able to do this. And then you do it and you do it. It becomes a routine. And then next thing you know, it's like it's cake, right? Oh, easy. Yeah, for sure. And that's the thing. Like when I tell people fasting, some people are like, I would literally die if I, I would die. Do that. Like, yeah. First of all, <laughs> literally, you would not die because our bodies are far more intelligent than we that. We wouldn't be here if we would <laughs> die if we didn't eat in 12 hours. This is the crazy thing. Like people – like today, we are so spoiled with food uh, and in, every instant gratification. We, oh, my god. It's so easy to get food nowadays. We have no appreciation for it. Nope. I love it. So, yeah, I mean, fasting, I mean, at, at this point, like, yeah, like you said, it's pretty much cake. What is uh, what is your everyday uh, looking like? Are you a 16-8 guy, 24? What, are you an OMAD guy, one meal a day? I, I mean, sometimes, yeah. It really, it's kind of all over the place. But for the most part, it's like two meals a day. I'm, I'm mostly 16-8, sometimes, I mean, 20 hours fasting, four-hour windows. I mean, it's nothing – like, it's, it's always at least 16-8. And then I kind of play around with it, usually one or two meals a day. When, it's like, when can I sit down and hammer three pounds of ribeye? Exactly. No, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> that's the question. Dude, I'm, I'm full. I'm like, I'm so experimental with my body and to trying to determine like where I'm most optimal. And right now I'm, I'm feeling unreal as far as cognitively, physically, uh, with just straight up OMAD, like 22, two strict, strict carnivore. It's crazy. Yeah. I, I feel. I mean, I'm not. I, I did strict court, carnivore for about five weeks. Um, loved it. it. It definitely got expensive, um, oh, but yeah. it's it's 100 percent worth it. Can I give you a um, hack? But, huh? I, I got to give you a hack, dude. A, a yeah, carnivore yeah. hack. Well, I guess you. I mean, I know you're a California guy, so. Um, anyways, it doesn't even matter where you're at, but go on mygrocerydeals.com 
and you literally type in your location or it just does it for you. And then you search stake and it'll give you like a 20 mile radius or I think you can even set the radius and it'll give you all of like the stake deals that week. <laughs> no shit. Bro, I like I'm constantly posting stuff or trying to and people get so mad because I'll be coming home with like five ninety nine a pound boneless strips, five ninety nine a pound boneless ribeyes. I just looked up. I got to go on a refeed uh, here in a little bit or uh, another haul to the, to the butcher shop. And uh, we got what was it? Four five ninety nine bone in ribeyes for this week. So I don't know if my mm. freezer is going to be able to handle it. God damn, that's an amazing deal. Yeah, I'm paying like 25 for a pound. Dude, it, mygrocerydeals.com, man. I'm telling you, uh, it'll 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 save the bank. And that goes for everything too. Like, you know, if I need a re-up on the old coffee, I'll just type in coffee and it'll give me like all all the deals in my area on coffee. So there's a little no. hack for you. Uh, my go-to is these the ribeye steak, some ground lamb, and then a ton of vegetables. Oh, dude, veggies? You're on that veggie game? I mean, I, sh- I honestly, I should not say ton of vegetables. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually, it's a rather small. I have no idea why I just said shit ton of vegetables. It's rather small. Everyone always like messaged me on Instagram, like, do you ever have vegetables? I'm like, it's in there. It, it's there. Oh gosh, yeah. Um, I think I saw on your story t- the other day you ate a salad and you were like, "What is this?" <laughs> <laughs> I had a salad with like six sides of like meat. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I dabble with with some veggies. I don't go crazy with them. Um, I, I get some vegetables, but my, my foundation is always going to be meat. It, it, it's always meat. Totally. Um, all right, man. Well, I think it's time for us to dive into the the old functional range conditioning element of uh, let's do of, it of the show. So I'm going blue pill um, so with this one. So, um, so you, obviously we know kind of how it started. And like we talked about a little bit before the show, I told you my kind of you know int- introduction to it. Um, obviously to me, man, and I think you could attest to this as well, it's, it's a very addictive process. You know? mm-hmm. um, so kind of take me through like that starting foundation. I, I actually enjoy hearing people's you know, starting point. Like, obviously, it's one of those things. I don't think you jump into it and you're going to excel right away. It's it's a true testament to your character and trying to stick with it. So, uh, if you can, man, like, take us through those starting that initial FRC phase, if you will. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so I, I take the the weekend course, September 2017. Literally, the first day I get back because it was in uh, Southern California. I was coming from the Bay Area. So I come back first day, I dive right into cars, controlled articular rotations. I started doing them every single day. Um, now for like the first like two to three months, my body felt freaking horrible. I'm taking them through these, I'm taking my joints through ranges of motion that it mm. hasn't expressed in years and years. Um, so there's a ton of aches and pains. There's, a, there's so many limitations and I'm finding out so much about my body. Before this, I, did, I didn't really, I wasn't very aware of what was going on apparently Um, Because when I'm taking them through these ranges of motion that they haven't been in years, oh, man, my my body felt terrible. I'm like, this is horrible. This this hurts. Um, This is uncomfortable. It just didn't feel right. But you'd see the progress. Like you would feel better after doing them and the next couple days after doing it. But during the process, just because you haven't been expressing them, man, it it, it was brutal. And it was – it was really eye opening because I was like, "Man, you're a personal trainer and your body is fucked up." <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> it's like, what is this? I mean, am I supposed to like feel this like everywhere? I'm like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> dude. We got to get that hashtag faces of FRC trending. Oh my god, that's that so would good. blow up. That's hilarious. I, I look so. Sometimes I'm like, I'm not gonna post that video on my <laughs> Instagram. <laughs> yeah, I do. I, I do some weird things with my mouth. I'm just like I'm always like it looks like I'm nibbling on, some, on something or chewing oh, gum. God. It's weird. I'm a big something about my jaw. Like I feel like I, I don't know why. I mean, obviously I got uh, thankfully I have a beard to hide it, but like I stick my jaw out and I get in this weird. I don't know. You know that that phase though when you're going freaking full like 
end range contraction and you're you don't know if you're gonna poop or die <laughs> <laughs> for sure when you're just going like all out neurological drive i look like i probably look really mean like i probably look evil like i probably look demented oh that's sick <laughs> yeah like i have this look in my eyes like oh, i'm ready to fucking irradiate <laughs> dude irradiate is such a fun word to say too like you can't say irradiate without like not being angry <laughs> no I, 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 yeah, you're right i say that shit all the time irradiate or die <laughs> um so I, back to like uh, like i said i kind of geek out about like routines and i know i get a lot of questions on my account from you know hey what is your routine or what is this and that uh what is your like daily you know, FRC intake look like? Are you a morning, afternoon, night, or what What kind of FRC are you doing every day? Yeah, I mean, typically I wake up around 5 a.m. and then I head straight to work. And my, my, my training period is usually in the afternoon. So around lunchtime, that's when I go into my training sessions for myself. Um, every single day, I, I do some form of controlled articular rotations where I'll spend at the very minimum 30 minutes on it. But typically, it's going to be around an hour to 90 minutes of pure controlled articular rotations, multiple different base positions, different styles of controlled rot rotations, like some are just capsular, some are more global movements. Um, and then I'll, I'll really dig into more isometric loading. Mm. I'll do that kinetic stretching, the pails and rails, and some other forms of end range strength training. Um, but typically, I spend about two hours to two and a half hours at least five times a week of doing pure FRC mobility type work. Um, the other one or two days, I'll do my my 30 to 60 minutes of controlled articular rotations, and then I'll go into more traditional weightlifting and strength training for more of my mid-ranges. Dude, uh, by the way, congrats on the uh, PR. Dude. Oh, yeah. The, the, the was, it 15? <laughs> was it 15? It was 30s? It was the 30-pounder, yeah. Oh my gosh, dude. I, I haven't even, I don't even think I've built up the hip capacity to do like a, a quadruped freaking hip car with an ankle weight on. <laughs> and dude, it's brutal. It. It's stupid. Like who does that, right? We're stupid. Um, we're it's so dude, my hips are still sore from that. <laughs> why are, why, it's like, why do people listen to us? Like if we were going to put their body through that much pain. <laughs> Sadist. Oh, dude. So I, I, I do want to cl uh, clarify this on the show because I know probably a lot of my guys are listening and, and going, you know, so is it okay to load, right? I think that's another big popular topic, especially like with mm. the Instagram thing. You know, I know a lot of people are going to watch your video and go, gosh, that looks dope. I'm going to do it and then probably <laughs> blow out a hip capsule. So <laughs> talk about the importance, man, of like establishing a foundation, establishing the range of motion, and then you know, once it comes time from the mastery of the, you know, the body weight variations, then maybe talk about loading. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's, that's the first thing we have to do. We have to, especially for our joints, when we're getting to this, this type of training, we're taking our joints through motions that they haven't done and haven't experienced in years and years. So the first thing we have to do right away is establish rotational integrity to the joints. Our joints are made to rotate and move, but they do not rotate and move in the way we live life and the way we train globally. So if we're taking our joints through this, we just need to establish rotational integrity, body weight, lighter intensity, controlled articular rotations. Get your joints used to this stuff for weeks and weeks. And the main thing I preach to my clients who are first initially starting out with this type of stuff this is a learning period. We're learning about your body. We're trying to we're, we're trying to teach your body certain things. How to initiate movements exactly where we want. How to move your joint in a rotational manner by initiating at the joint and not just kind of lifting your arm up and pushing through it. Um, we need to understand irradiation and the neurological drive element. You you have to learn about your nervous system as well. Um, so there's many things that we're we're teaching your body in this initial period for the first four to six weeks. Um, and then we can start training your joints to build up capacity, but we're still at body weight type stuff. Um, now we're starting to get better at increasing your radiation and increasing the amount of neural drive. Um, and once we start doing that and we're getting better at using our nervous system, better at not compensating through the rest of our body, we establish rotational integrity. We start building up some capacity in these joints. Then we can start loading them. Um, it's like anything else. Like if we're initially starting out, there's a learning curve. We have to learn what we're doing first, initiate where we want to do it, um, start building up capacity, and then we progressively overload it. Um, so nothing in life you want to kind of jump into that and just go balls to the wall right away. That's just – you're just going to get injured right away. 
Oh, dude. Yeah. I mean, I think that's huge too, man. Like, I mean, I think I already touched on it, but you know, any kid that is out there, it's whatever's big, right? So it's like, what's the new hot thing today? It's, I think FRC is coming, becoming hot, dude. Like a lot of people are doing it. A lot of people are posting about it. A kid sees that and goes, let's dive in. And then they're trying to replicate these positions that you are in. And, um, they, you know, have a, there's, there's, potential injury there so talk, sure. talk talk about that man like the importance of because i know bridget and tracy over at vital roots in in colorado like we we talk a lot about the importance of the initial stages of frc and getting um in touch with somebody that is certified to where they can really assist you through it absolutely i mean the the, the first thing we have to understand first and foremost is the very specific biology that we're working with. So whoever it is, whether it's me or someone else, we all have different biology. Our anatomy may be similar, but our, our biological makeup is completely different. So we have to learn our own limitations, our own weaknesses. What ranges are we strong at? What ranges are we weak at? And then this is how we this is how we kind of tailor the, the program for a specific biology. And that's the main thing we have to understand. Like this is not just FRC. This is not just strength training or whatever it may be. This is we're literally like this is like a science project. We're taking someone's biology and we are altering it. So it's very important that we know what we're doing because we can alter our biology for the worse as well if we put incorrect inputs or we overload something way too quickly or if we're doing something that our body doesn't have the capacity for yet. So if you're initially trying to get into the stuff. I absolutely recommend working with a practitioner who knows what they're doing because the first thing we're going to do as a high-level practitioner is assess the human being. We have to assess your joints and how do your joints move. Is there any rotational integrity? What kind of capacity do you have? What ranges of motion can you express? What ranges of motion can you not express? we got to go injury background. I mean there's so many layers to all this mm-hmm. stuff. Um, so we really want to work with someone who knows what they're doing, knows how to assess a human being, and then knows how to progressively um, program specific movements for this specific individual biology. And that's the biggest thing. Um, and that's what I'd love people to really take away from it, from all of this stuff is to understand all of our biology is vastly different. We have to assess this specific biology and then kind of tailor a, a program specific for this human being. Gosh, dude. Yeah, I mean, you hit it, man. I think that's uh... – that's with a lot of facets in life too. I mean, I, I even like kind of correlate that into the, the the baseball industry too, with a way that an individual moves when they're hitting or when they're pitching. You know, like we all have certain limitations, or we all do certain things biomechanically better than someone, and we can't really, uh, you know, kind of speaking on the baseball space still is like we can't really teach a pitcher to move a way that I move, even though I have more. Um, you know, ability to extend my hip capsules or, you know, extend my drive leg or whatever it is. I think it's, yep. it always goes back to understanding the individual and, and, and uh, having a high importance about building a routine f- specifically for that guy. But also I'm, I'm, I'm in the game as far as like the, the athlete or the individual has to understand thyself as well. Right. Mm hmm. I mean, that's, uh, I think that's like where it kind of gets misinterpreted too, is uh, I think we live in a society where, uh, you know, I think a lot of people uh, rely on other people to like understand themselves or like, hey, tell me how to do this, tell me how to do that. And and then they lose sight on how they do it. Exactly, for sure. And and that's like the big thing that I I try to work on with my clients in that initial period when I kind of told you like three to six weeks, maybe that learning period. Like I'm, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to teach my clients why we're doing this, and teach them about the science of, of what's happening, and, and teaching them about biology, um, body awareness, body control. There's so many elements that you're going to have to learn within yourself if you really want to progress to the next step. It's not all about just listening to a coach and have them give you an exercise and then you do the exercise. That's yeah. not enough. There's so many layers to this, and and once again, we need to we need to stop looking at fitness and exercise in the way that is portrayed right now, um, and we need to start understanding like human biology. Like this is this is not just fitness and exercise. We're we're making changes to your biology. It is important for you to understand this type of stuff, um, especially if you want to progress to that next step. Mm, dude, I freaking love it, man. I want to. Uh... 
I want to switch gears a little bit. I do want to talk a little bit about like strength training. And, uh, mm-hmm. and I know certain individuals like maybe have like a different interpretation as far as like, uh, I don't know if I would determine FRC as strength training. I don't know where you stand on that, but I'm assuming when you say strength training, you're talking like the typical, you know, power lifting exercises. I mean, for, for the way I view strength training, it's, it's going to be all of this stuff. It's going to include those conventional lifts. Um, that we kind of know as strength training, but it's also going to be the FRC stuff with the joints. It's going to be things that strengthen your nervous system and your neurological ability to create tension and force. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, to me personally, there's so many layers to strength training, and we've only prioritized like one or two of them. We've done our conventional strength training and our weightlifting, um, and then we do our, our, our cardiovascular health and capacity as well, which is obviously very important to our strength. But I I feel like there's like three more layers to that. One's going to be the joint stuff, like the FRC stuff. If our joints cannot express movements with a high amount of capacity, it doesn't matter what your muscles can do. It doesn't matter how strong your muscles are. You will develop under compensations and dysfunctions. Mm. This is the human body. All of our joints are, are pivot points, and they can create separate movements as opposed to the musculature. So these pivot points and these these areas that can rotate, if they can't move with high quality, this is bad. This is not going to represent strength very well. So our idea of strength is kind of it's kind of skewed. Like we're we're so focused on like lifting heavy weights, and that's just that's just one element element of it. But without the other without the other elements, it's com- it's it's incomplete, and it, and you're setting yourself up to hit plateaus to run into injuries, to have chronic aches and ailments and, and, and things that are going to be debilitating after a while. So it's important that we, we cover the whole piece and, and there's so many different pieces. Dude, so are you, are you on, on, the, on board with the, the movement before strength motto? <laughs> I mean, I think first and foremost, we have to conquer you know, yourself. You have to conquer your own body, first and foremost. You have to make sure... Your ability to express movements by itself without any kind of load is of high quality. And if it is not, if we go ahead and load those areas, you will develop undercompensations and dysfunctions 100%. So 100%, I, I think it's important to establish your foundation within your own biology of high quality. So once you start loading it, you're, you're able to have the type of capacity to absorb this load and build on it correctly. Dude, there's a topic, man, that I, I want to – you'd be a perfect guy to talk about too is like I don't know because, again, I know I come from like the baseball space and, the, and I'm on the pitching side of things. And obviously with pitching mechanics, it's movement and it, it's expressing that movement, exploring that movement and determining what you can and cannot do, right? Obviously there's an optimal way to go about that as far as like force transfers and stability and all of that other stuff. And, and there's a, probably a, a non-optimal way to go about it. But – I'm stuck on this notion right now that bad and good movement is relative. Would you would you like would you kind of agree with that or is it is there bad and move, bad and good movement? I mean, there, there's good and bad, but it's very specific to the individual performing it. And th- and that's my biggest thing. Like, I don't think there's any any movement that's globally good or globally bad. Uh-huh. I mean, that's one big thing that I always talk about on my social media is like, I don't think there's a, a right or wrong exercise or a right or wrong posture or form or anything like that. It is a very dependent on the biology who is expressing this movement, expressing this exercise. Because once again, <clears throat> if there's something wrong or limiting in their biology, no matter matter how good it might be for someone else it could be completely detrimental to the wrong person so to me the there is no good and bad it just more it could be good or good or bad depending on the specific individual performing it if the if the individual can can get into a movement or get into a specific you know pattern or whatever their body can get into and if they can explore within that and breathe and control it and own it I mean, would you say that it's an optimal movement for him? I mean, it, it, it'd be too vague. I, and, I, and I personally, I, I never know, assess you know. global movements because your body can 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 compensate in so many different oh, ways dude, yeah. to make something visually look correct. You know, and that's my big beef with like biomechanics. Like totally, aesthetically, dude. visually, mm. you may be in perfect biomechanics when you're doing a deadlift or a hip hinge. 
but there's so many areas that could be compensating and still internally your joints may not be able to express these movements with high integrity so we're we're not we're not we're not being optimal whatsoever in certain situations so it, it's a little hard to say without knowing the specific individual mm-hmm. and assessing them and then going into that movement I love that you say like compensation, man, because compensation or body like that, that is the, the sole reason that, I mean, I found out later that I blew my lat out, man, was because mm-hmm. I wasn't moving efficiently and my lats being the, the biggest muscle, you know, involved in the upper trunk, um, wanted to take over and it wanted to compensate. And over time it wasn't designed to do what it was doing at the time and, and freaking blew out. And I think ever since that happened, you know, obviously we talk about kind of, uh, certain things in our life happening and then us growing in a different area from it. And that's kind of where I'm at in my life as well right now is like, yeah, this stupid freaking injury happened, but I learned a ton about my body, the way I move, like how I should move, what I should do to not compensate and all of that stuff. But I do want to go back to that conversation is like how I know, you know, some of my listeners will probably hear what you just said about determining if it's optimal or not. So how does one kind of like self screen themselves, I guess? Um, Again, I know it's pretty vague, but how can like one kind of put themselves through a screening period to determine their deficiencies in that regard? Yeah, I mean, I mean, my go to is always going to be you got to find a high level practitioner to assess you. Mm-hmm. Um, now, now, let's say this is it's completely like no one, someone just cannot afford it or whatever the situation may be. Um, there's no way they can do it. They got to understand like this is there's there's many details in, within this to kind of be able to explore on your own is incredibly hard. Um, but you, the first thing I would do for that specific in, individual is go joint by joint and see how your joints move in isolation. Yeah. Can they express movements with inte- integrity in isolation? Can they rotate? Like if you lay on your back and you bring your hip up at about a 90 degree angle, can you rotate your hip back and forth internally, externally with decent quality and, and good movement potential? Um, if the answer is no, like that's not good. Yeah. And these are this is the case for all of our joints. And just because of the way we're living in the society and what we think strength training and, and, and exercise is nowadays – our joints simply do not get what they need to be getting. So there's a lot of dysfunction that just happened at the joint level. Um, and that's why I think FRC is going to be so successful right now because, like, we are targeting areas that is so fucked in the fitness industry because no one is doing it. Right. And this is why so many people are having great success with it. Um, now, if there are certain individuals that have great – they've had a big dance background or whatever, whatever it may be, that their joints haven't been compromised and they move with good integrity, they'll look at FRC stuff and they'll be like, well, like I'm already good at all this shit. Like I don't need to be doing that. Mm. And that's that's part true. Like could they get much stronger because of that? Absolutely. Mm. Is that something that they ne- necessarily need? Eh, maybe not. Um, but there's so many individuals who absolutely need this. They, they do. And that's why my go-to is like you have to find a practitioner. You have to – like save up some money and then when you're going to this practitioner to learn as much as you can yeah. don't go there and just get like coached up for the day like go there and learn as much as you possibly can yeah totally and then it's like listening to podcasts like this one man i mean not mine but like this episode in particular is like listening and being like oh that makes sense now i have more of a motivation to freaking dive into it and explore yeah Right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this, 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 there's so many layers to this stuff, and it's very in depth. And like, you're you're learning about scientific principles, you're learning about your own biology. Um, if you if you don't have this type of background, you're not into this. It's very hard to do it on your own initially. The best thing you can do is find a good quality coach, learn as much as you can, um, whatever you're willing to spend. It, it, find a good coach, and it will be completely worth it. It'll be so valuable to you. Um, and there's so many people who really want the next step and they want optimal or they want to get healthy. They want to beat these injuries or whatever it may be. Um, and they just need the right type of coach and, and to be able to learn and be able to do this stuff on their own eventually. Speaking of valuable and um, optimal, where do you stand being a California guy with In-N-Out Burger? Oh man, it's so amazing! Oh gosh, quoted it and send it. <laughs> it's tasty, man. Dude, will you FedEx you... me some right now? Just, just go oh. ahead. And I, I need, uh, I need ten flying Dutchmen. 
I don't know if Ooh, you're on that game. Yeah. Oh, you're on that game. All right. Yeah, yeah, I know about it. Sean, Sean Baker's all about it. <laughs> That's my guy, dude. Oh, gee, she's an animal. I love it. Um, hey, man, uh, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, dude, but um, I do want to, you know, give you an opportunity to tell my listeners where they can follow you, or if you got any links you want to shout out, then uh, the floor is yours, man. Yeah, for sure. I mean, anyone can follow me on my Instagram. That's pretty much the only social media platform that I really use right now. It's beard the best you can be. Um, I did open up a YouTube channel a couple months ago, and I just posted like a couple videos on there. Um, It's the same tag, beard the best you can be, so you can find me on there. Um, But yeah, hit hit me up. Um, If you guys have any questions, you can can shoot them my way. I'm pretty decent at, at answering all my messages i got a couple backed up right now. But, yeah, if you guys are interested in learning more and then also finding more like-minded practitioners who are kind of speaking the same language, um, i got a whole bunch of friends who are doing amazing things in the industry right now, and they're all over the United States and um, even international. So if you guys want to get hooked up in, in different areas, message me. Be like, I'm looking for a practitioner in this location. I'll, I'll try to help you find a good one. No so doubt, man. Instagram, awesome. beard the best you can be. Awesome. I heard you're in the running for like best Instagram username of all time. Good luck with that. Who who, who said this? I, I, I did. <laughs> hey, let's make it a thing. Oh, might as well, man. <laughs> all right, dude. Uh, appreciate your time, man. And I'll sign you off off the air. Yeah, sounds good, brother. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. All right, dudes. Well, I know probably not a lot of you like listen to the very end of my show. But um, I'm going to challenge you. For those of you who do listen to the end of the show, I have a challenge. Go to your podcast app. You're on your podcast app. You're listening to my show. When I'm done speaking, go to your podcast app. If it's, if it's Apple Podcast, go to the bottom right where it says search. You'll click that search bar. You'll type in The Robbie Rowe Show. Hit search. My show will come up. Click it. And then you'll see recent episodes, ratings, 2018, 2019. You scroll down, scroll down, and then you'll see it. Ratings and reviews. Well, you have an option to click amount of stars. I encourage you to click five. But it doesn't matter. It does matter. I lied. Go ahead and give me a review, click the stars, scroll down a little bit more. You'll see a a tab that says write a review. I would highly, highly appreciate if you could leave me a positive review. The reason being is that the reviews go into an algorithm that the more you get, the more written reviews you get, it increases the uh, show's awareness to other people that listen to podcasts. So the whole foundation for why this started was, was to supply the individuals that seek out quality content, quality information, knowledge, just to supply them with as much as I can provide. So by you leaving me a review, you could potentially have someone see my show that maybe wouldn't have seen it and then therefore get some information, some a guest, uh, maybe from me, doesn't matter. If they get the information, they utilize it, then they can be a better individual. So I challenge you guys with that. I appreciate you if you do. If you want, go ahead and screenshot that you did it. Send it in my Instagram DM, and uh, I'll share it on my story. So appreciate you all. Love you all. God bless. Enjoy the rest of your day.